Quietly, please. Thank you. And the next item of business is Members' Business Debate on Motion 14820 in the name of Emma Harper on the 30th World AIDS Day. The debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Emma Harper to open the debate for around seven minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. December 1st marks World AIDS Day, and I'm pleased to be able to reflect on the importance of this day on the 30th anniversary this year. Today is an opportunity to raise awareness of HIV and the impact that the stigma and the prejudice surrounding HIV and AIDS has on the people diagnosed and undiagnosed. Firstly, I'd like to thank my colleagues across Chamber who have supported my motion and for taking part in this debate. And I welcome those in the gallery here today and also those watching online. The debate allows the opportunity to reflect on the past 30 years of infection, detection, diagnosis and now successful treatment. Today in Scotland, there are 5,134 people that are diagnosed with HIV and 350 new cases each year are diagnosed. Presiding officer, I cannot stress enough how important it is to get the message across to everyone that once a person has received a diagnosis and appropriate, appropriate treatment, and once a person becomes undetectable in their viral load of the HIV virus, they cannot pass on the virus through sexual transmission. Last week in Parliament, I met with Murray Cheek and Grant Sugden from Waverley Care to discuss their work. Waverley Care, alongside NHS boards across Scotland, are doing important work to promote the importance of people knowing their HIV status, as well as to promote the undetectable equals untransmissible U equals U message, which is a key focus of this 30th anniversary World AIDS Day. Again, this means that if a person living with HIV achieves and maintains an undetectable viral load by adhering to their medication, the HIV virus cannot be passed on through sex. In preparation for this debate, I reflected on my time at Cedar sinai Medical Centre in the heart of West Hollywood in Los Angeles in the early 90s. And I contacted my former colleague, Jackie Engstrand, who worked as a re research nurse in the dedicated HIV and AIDS unit known as the unit set up in 1991. This was when the model of care for people with AIDS focused on a palliative end of life care approach. By the early 90s, we knew that HIV was a bloodborne virus that weakened the immune system, and when left untreated, people had a range of potentially dead, deadly infections. Back then, I looked after patients with a rare skin condition called Kaposi's sarcoma, as well as pneumocystis carinae pneumonia patients, and that's a rare lung condition infection that is often one of the infections seen in people with HIV. The stigma associated with, H with HIV was evident. I recall people referring to the disease as gay-related immune disease, GRID, which was distressing for patients, but we have made progress since then. And as a nurse, I knew that the HIV virus was transmitted through sex and sharing of needles. It was not just a gay man's disease. While I was in the pre-op area in the operating room one day, I had an interesting experience when I witnessed a colleague's nervous, anxious behaviour when he was speaking to a patient ahead of the surgery, and this patient had a diagnosis of AIDS. I was dumbfounded when my anaesthetist colleague, an educated, well-trained, very knowledgeable doctor, he entered the pre-op area wearing a gown, uh, double gloves, a mask and a face shield, and he spoke to the patient from one metre away without touching the patient. He looked like we, he was in one of those viral protective breakout gear seen in the movies. HIV is not transmitted through airborne route. Standard precautions are required. No double gloves are needed. Presiding officer was shocked to hear from Nathan Sparling of HIV Scotland only yesterday when he said that double gloving recommendations are still made today when dealing with our elderly HIV positive persons. And the prejudice and stigma still remains as persons with HIV are still placed on the end of dental lists or clinic reviews. This is not needed. Standard precautions are adequate when dealing with any bloodborne virus patient. I'm therefore pleased to endorse and indeed encourage health professionals across Scotland to view HIV Scotland's Roadmap to Zero document, which contains important information about st tackling stigma. Presiding officer, at a World AIDS Day event in Parliament last week, I sat next to one of the poets, 
James McAbraham, who recited his poem from the wee book called Disclosures, Rewriting the Narrative About HIV. In James's poem, the opening lines describe uh, it, how it had been such a long time since someone touched him. It was James's poem that reminded me of that experience in the pre-op area 28 years ago. Pres Presiding officer, as time progresses, new drugs started to become available. Words like protease inhibitors, antiretrovirals, and heart therapy have become common in our vocabulary. While in Los Angeles, a famous basketball player, Magic Johnson, announced that he had an undetectable viral load. Undetectable was not a cure, as the media touted. Undetectable equals untransmissible. You must remember that. He was a heterosexual man, and this was big, big, huge news. Magic Johnson could not pass on the virus through sex. This is the message that we need to share today. Undetectable equals untransmissible. Presiding officer, I'm pleased that Scotland is a leader in the fight against HIV and AIDS. We are meeting the United Nations 90-90-90 targets. These are that by 2020, 90% of all people living with HIV will know their HIV status, and 90% of all people diagnosed with HIV will have access to sustained antiretroviral therapy, and that 90% of the people in receipt of the antiretroviral therapy will have viral suppression or a negative viral load. If we can find, reach and test the 10% of Scots that have not been tested, we can initiate treatment so that the virus will not be passed on and shared. Once a diagnosis is made, it means treatment can begin. Today in Scotland, HIV is considered a manageable long-term health condition with treatments such as pre-exposure prophylaxis, PrEP, that allows people to be protected. Testing has a central role to play in reducing the number of infections, particularly by helping to reduce the proportion of HIV cases that are undiagnosed. Testing is as simple as a finger prick blood sample. Results are known immediately. People can be tested at sexual health clinics, GP surgeries, home self-testing is available, and community projects also. In conclusion, I'd like to emphasize the importance of the need to fight stigma attached to this disease. It has a damaging impact on the physical and mental health of the people both living with HIV and those who are thinking about being tested. Presiding officer, I look forward to hearing my colleagues' contributions in this debate. And once more, I'd like to reiterate that you equals you, undetectable equals untransmittable. And I encourage everyone to know their HIV status. Thank you. Can I ask those in the public gallery not to show appreciation or otherwise? Thank you very much. And we move to the open debate. The speeches of four minutes, please. Miles Briggs, followed by Ruth McGuire. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to start by thanking Emma Harper for bringing this members' debate to Parliament today. And I'm pleased to be taking part in the debate on the 30th World AIDS Day, which raises awareness of HIV, challenges stigma, and is a chance for all of us to reflect on the progress that has actually been made uh, to tackle HIV and AIDS. Since the first World AIDS Day in December the 1st, 1988, um, when I was just five, there's been huge progress to end um, the AIDS epidemic and also uh, to tackle stigma, which we've seen. Early diagnosis and proper treatment, HIV is now manageable long-term and is a long-term health condition. I think we need to talk about that uh, more as well, and medical professionals do as well. As Emma Harper has rightly stated, um, as well as being manageable, HIV is also untransmittable for people who achieve and maintain an undetectable viral load. I very much agree with Emma Harper um, that the U equals U message needs to get out there. It's crucial for an improved understanding of HIV, a reduction in stigma, as well as, as achieving fewer uh, new infections in the future. Stigma is probably the biggest obstacle in the fight against AIDS, HIV, and making people living with HIV or feel isolated. I think that's something which people um, I've spoken to often tell me, as well as stopping people from actually being tested and accessing treatments. And I'd like to say a huge thank you to HIV Scotland for all their excellent work that they're doing to change the narrative around HIV and AIDS and congratulate them on the launch of their new book, which has been mentioned already, Disclosures Rewrite Rewriting the Narrative about HIV. And I'm very thank uh, thankful for them uh, for giving me a copy of that last week. I haven't had a chance to read it, but I'm looking forward to over our uh, uh, winter recess. 
I find it shocking that the recent survey actually by uh, Waverly Care revealed that 14% of respondents did not have sympathy for those living with HIV. This reinforces to me that more still very much needs to be done to tackle stigma and something which I hope this debate helps uh, to highlight. Um, last week, Deputy Presiding Officer in the House of Commons, Labour MP Lloyd Russell uh, Moyle announced uh, to the nation that he is HIV positive. And in his speech, uh, Mr. Russell Moyle spoke about when he was diagnosed as HIV positive 10 years ago and everything that uh, went through his head during that uh, time. He also talked about how the uh, medication he now takes means that he can be healthy, have and any partner that he may have uh, can be protected, and promoting the message of undetectable is un equals untransmittable. Mr. Royal Mo Moyle's bravery in talking about his own diagnosis and his message that the status of being HIV positive does not define a person will, I think, go a long way in reducing the stigma associated with HIV and AIDS. And I repeat his important message and, and that which Emma Harper has also made today, that people need to look towards their status and be tested. And instead of uh, not doing so out of fear, that it's better to live in knowledge uh, than die in fear. And I fully support the goal of having zero new infections in Scotland and believe here in Scotland we can actually work to achieve that. In 2017 there were 368 new cases of HIV reported. So far since uh, September there have been 218 new cases reported in Scotland. For the UNAIDS Fast Track Strategy 1990 targets, in Scotland it's estimated that 87% of infected people know their status and that those who do, 98% are now retrieving, uh, receiving uh, antiretroviral treatment, around 97% have achieved viral uh, suppression. This debate is a really important one. I think uh, I'm pleased to take part in it every year because Scotland quite rightly can lead the way in, in, in eliminating new HIV infections. But to do this, more work still needs to be done. Firstly, and most importantly, uh, to fight the stigma around HIV and AIDS so that more people have the confidence to be tested and we can stop uh, the spread of this virus. Finally, just to close, I'd like to thank Emma Harper once again for bringing this forward and look forward to uh, listening to other contributions this afternoon. Thank you. Uh, Ruth Maguire, followed by Mary Fee. Presiding officer, I thank Emma Harper for securing this important debate on World AIDS Day and giving us the opportunity to come together across the chamber and show support for people living with HIV and to commemorate those who have died from an AIDS-related illness. I'd like to use my time today to speak about women and HIV and give particular mention to the excellent report by the Terence Higgins Trust Women, HIV, Invisible, No Longer. I'm also grateful to Waverley Care for their briefing around the work of the African Health Project. Waverley Care's African Health Project was established in 2003 to meet the needs of Scotland's growing African population. The project is there to provide information, advice and support to Africans living in Scotland. And despite a lack of a specific figure for Scotland, we know that HIV disproportionately affects African communities and that late diagnosis, which can lead to health complications, is common. These inequalities are largely driven by HIV stigma and a lack of awareness about the condition, which can sometimes be reinforced by cultural and religious beliefs. For Africans living with HIV, this stigma can lead to isolation from the community, a breakdown of relationships, and negative impacts on their physical and mental health. In particular, the project aims to improve health and wellbeing and to support people to access healthcare services, including HIV treatment and care. Waverly Care work closely with community groups, businesses and churches to raise awareness of HIV and to promote sexual health. This includes making condoms freely available in community venues in areas where they work alongside offering testing for HIV, hepatitis B and hepatitis C. Waverly Care also support people with other issues affecting the African community, including immigration, housing, managing money and employment. Presiding officer, Women make up one third of all people living with HIV and were one quarter of new HIV diagnosis in 2016. Despite this, I think it's fair to say that women living with HIV have not been particularly visible in the narrative and the response to HIV in the UK and that we don't know very much about what it means to be a woman living with HIV in Scotland. 
from my constituency work and as reported in the Women HIV Invisible No Longer, we do know that HIV services that do exist are rarely designed with women in mind. People living with and affected by HIV are not a homogenous group and to treat them as such will result in services that don't meet their needs and worse, could risk um, not reaching those for whom the safety net already has massive holes. It's estimated that 1,300 women are living with undiagnosed HIV. Improving rates of early diagnosis is critical both for individual and public health, and HIV testing is key to achieving this. And I would echo Emma Harper's call for everybody to know their HIV status. If diagnosed early and on effective treatments, people with HIV can live a normal life expectancy. When diagnosed at a late stage, if significant damage to the immune system has already occurred, people have poorer health outcomes and potentially a much reduced life expectancy. Furthermore, if someone is unaware of their HIV status and not on treatment, then it's much more likely that they will unknowingly pass on HIV to others. The HIV prevention drug PrEP is, almost, uh, is currently almost exclusively accessed by men. In the first eight months that PrEP was available on the NHS in Scotland, only 10 out of 1,299 uh, 1, people to access the drug were women. Waverly Care have told me that one in 21 heterosexual African women in Scotland are living with HIV, and we know that a third of all people living with HIV are women. So in closing, can I ask the Scottish Government what is being done to redress the imbalance of access to the drug? And can I also offer um, to bring together interested parties to assist the government in that work, if it would be helpful? Thank you, Presiding Officer. Mary Fee, followed by Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to contribute to this important debate, and I'd like to thank Emma Harper for bringing it to the Chamber today. Last Saturday, December the 1st, marked the 30th anniversary of World AIDS Day. And that landmark provides us an, an opportunity as parliamentary, parliamentarians and as Scottish society more broadly to reflect on the significant progress we have made over the last three decades in the fight against HIV through prevention, treatment and destigmatisation. And as we've heard today, HIV is now a manageable long-term health condition. With proper treatment, individuals can live long, healthy lives and experience either very few or no adverse symptoms of their illness. However, this was not always the case. And during the 1980s, when the diagnosis of HIV increased substantially in a short period, the virus was viewed as a, a death sentence by many, perceived to significantly shorten the lives of those diagnosed. And the story of HIV in Scotland and across the UK was shaped by homophobic and moralistic rhetoric. Throughout the 1980s, HIV was labelled the gay plague, as homophobic misinformation spread quickly. It was a commonly held view that HIV was primarily spread by men having sex with men. And the original public health campaign to raise awareness of HIV that emerged during the 1980s included TV advertisements, posters and pamphlets, frequently evoking the imagery of intimate homosexual relationships. And these images fed into wider homophobic societal assumptions that homosexuality was wrong and it was immoral. And these public health campaigns disproportionately focused on the spread of HIV through sex between men and completely omitted discussion of other means of spreading HIV, including heterosexual intercourse and infection linked to injected drug use. And thankfully, through much protest, fighting and actively challenging the spread of homophobic misinformation, the stigma around HIV has significantly weakened over the last three decades. Although there is much work still to do in order to eradicate the scourge of homophobia from Scottish society, it is unquestionable that our country is now a more inclusive, more tolerant and a welcoming place for all LGB LGBT people. And earlier this year, the International Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Trans and Intersex Association ranked Scotland as the best country in Europe for LGBT equality for the second year in a row. The moralistic scare campaign around HIV of the 1980s is thankfully over. 
it is now widely accepted amongst the scientific community that a person living with HIV can take medication to manage their illness, allowing these individuals to achieve and maintain an undetectable viral load. This means that they cannot pass HIV on to sexual partners. The situation, as we've heard, is known as undetectable equals untransmittable. The e equals U, the, the U equals U status is a vital step which helps to challenge the stigma around HIV. U equals U highlights that people with HIV can live long, active, healthy lives. It is now our duty to make sure this information becomes more widely known in society and ensure that it is not knowledge which is only known and understood by the scientific community. And in coming to a close, presiding officer, I'd like to mention that despite the impressive progress which has been made in Scotland over the last 30 years in preventing, treating and managing HIV, the illness continues to remain a critical public health issue in many countries across the globe, particularly in the global south. Recent figures from AVERT illuminate the continuing prevalence of HIV, with over 36 million people living with HIV across the globe, including over one and a half million children. We cannot celebrate our progress in isolation. And although it is important that we recognise our own success, we must not become complacent in the fight against HIV. And it's time that we redoubled our efforts to work not only on a national level, but also on an international level, in order to help educate, prevent and treat HIV in pursuit of the United Nations AIDS 1990 target, which is to be achieved by 2020. Thank you. Patrick Harvey, followed by Gillian Martin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I also warmly thank Emma Harper for bringing this debate to the, the Chamber. Three decades of World AIDS days, it's a, a pretty extraordinary fact. I'm finding it pretty extraordinary to reflect on the fact that uh, I've been here in this place for half of that time. Uh, and I was just reading the, the transcript of the World AIDS Day debate that I took part in in 2003, uh, brought by a former uh, Labour colleague, Des McNulty, uh, who I bumped into the other day, actually, and exchanged a, a hello. But the, the fact that we've deba been debating this for so many times, uh, and I've, I've reflected on this at, at a couple of World AIDS Day events this year that I've spoken at, it's made me recognise how much has changed, but also how things have stayed the same. At that time, back in 2003, we were just debating Scotland's first ever sexual health and relationship strategy, which was still in draft. We didn't even yet have, have that uh, in place. And we still see, while progress has been made, we still see a great deal of patchiness around uh, sex education and relationships education in our schools and a continued drive to put pressure on all of us, uh, on political parties and on government, to improve that situation. I'd previously uh, been working just before I was elected in an HIV agency and we were, we were starting to see in the, the years before that uh, the first effective antiretrovirals becoming more available but at that time, they had many more difficult, problematic side effects. Uh, they usually involved a combination of, of drugs more complex than today and much more problematic, especially for people with chaotic lifestyles. We've now got to the point where we have so many more effective remedies, effective tools in the box, both for treatment, uh, which as other men members have mentioned, uh, uh, leads to a, a position where people can literally be unable to pass the virus on through sex, as well as new tools in the box on prevention, and, and people have mentioned pre-exposure, pre uh, preventative prophylaxis, the, the opportunity to uh, prevent HIV being transmitted uh, amongst people who are in the highest risk groups. I couldn't have imagined at that point that we'd be at the place where, where now we have those new tools in the box. And yet we still see issues around stigma. When I was a student, I was probably one of the, the luckier generation. If I'd come out a few years earlier, uh, you know, just before uh, condom provision was widespread, before people were talking about awareness of HIV, I might have been at much more risk. Uh, when I was a student, James Anderton, God's cop, uh, was the, the chief constable of Greater Manchester and being protected by the UK government uh, in his homophobic and bigoted 
uh, comments about HIV and AIDS, uh, authorising raids uh, on uh, gay clubs in Manchester, uh, which I was reminded of when, when Emma Harper was talking about a, a medical professional uh, using uh, surgical protective gear. Police being sent into clubs wearing biohazard uh, uh, equipment uh, in order to manhandle uh, people who were just out for a night out. An extraordinary level of ignorance and prejudice which was being cultivated deliberately at the time by those in power as well as by those with influence in the media. Well, a lot has changed, but still things are the same with stigma. There are still pockets of severe ignorance and prejudice uh, and stigma. Uh, and so I would also like to, to pay tribute, as Mr. Briggs did, uh, to Lloyd Russell Moyle, uh, whose actions in uh, coming out publicly as someone who has HIV, who has a positive diagnosis, to do that from the position uh, of the, the House of Commons for an MP to be able to say, not only I'm willing to challenge that stigma, but also someone with HIV can and does lead an active, healthy and long uh, life. Uh, and that, that is something that HIV positive people can expect. That's an important thing to do to challenge stigma. And as Mary Fee said as well, uh, we've, we've made progress, but there's still a huge way to go on the international aspects of this. Uh, and the, the idea that the 1990-90 target could be achieved around the world we're, we're still a long way from that. So a great deal has changed. A great deal is still the same. In closing, presiding officer, I would urge the Scottish Government, uh, which has a, a sexual health and bloodborne virus framework which runs to 2020. That means next year they'll be doing the work on the next update of that. I would urge the Scottish Government recognising those new tools that we have in the box for prevention and for treatment. Let's make the next update give a real commitment that we will set zero new infections of HIV as a, as a goal into government policy. That would be an important step forward and it would drive forward the further progress that we all need to make. Once again, can I thank Emma Harper for, for bringing this debate. Gillian Martin, followed by Jamie Green. Thank you, President Officer. I'd also like to thank my colleague and friend Emma Harper for bringing forward this debate to mark the 30th World AIDS Day. It's only a year since the First Minister publicly took a test for HIV in a bid to break down the barriers around getting tested. And that was an incredibly powerful moment and one that I'm sure helped to encourage more people to follow in our footsteps and get tested. We, we've come a long way also in decades, as many people have mentioned today, since HIV and AIDS entered the public consciousness and extraordinary headway has been made. And this is in, uh, due in large part to the bravery of those with the condition speaking out and to organisations including HIV Scotland and Waverley Care, which both make huge contributions to helping break down barriers and encourage testing. Within the NHS Grampian, the most recent figures show that there are an estimated 426 people within the health board's area living with a diagnosis of HIV. Before, uh, between 2009 and 2018, the figures for new diagnosis in NHS Grampian have fluctuated from 21 to high of 35 in 2013, for dropping to 17 in 2015 and rising slightly again to 22 last year. And, and I, I, I'm, I'm hoping that that's a result of more people feeling that they can come forward to get, to get tested and uh, get diagnosed. Because as everyone has mentioned today, it's hugely important to stop the spread. Presiding officer, while we welcome better detection rates, it's important that we're doing all we can to educate about protection and the importance of testing. And we know that HIV testing rates among Scottish respondents are worryingly low, and that was the phrase used that was in the recent report published by HIV Scotland. When I was researching for this debate, I wanted to have a look at what support has been offered to those with HIV in the North East in my constituency of Aberdeenshire East. And I came across the story of Colin Mackay, who's dedicated his life to helping support those with HIV. Now, Colin initially became involved with organisations which help support people, and he says it was out of guilt. And the reason, he says, is because he had personally distanced himself from someone he knew who'd been diagnosed, and he wanted he reflected on that and he wanted to make amends for that um, situation. Uh, he, he, he decided he wanted to use the feeling that he had and the fear that he had felt and channel that energy into helping people because he realised he could help and the more that he became involved with helping, the better he understood the illness and he could understand uh, how, how people uh, around those who were diagnosed with HIV felt and he could help educate them. 
He's helped many people find their own voice and able to say that they're struggling and deserve better support. And it's people like Colin who are so admirable because the more we chose to break down the barriers, the more we can encourage others. Um, I agree with Mary Fee, um, the messaging. I, I, I was reflecting on this, I was in my first year at university when there was that campaign, the kind of don't die of ignorance campaign with the icebergs and the ridiculous messaging across there. It was real scaremonging. It, it was, it was stigmatising, but it was deeply homophobic. The legacy of that is still damaging. It stops people coming forward for testing and it blinds people as to how the virus is actually spread, which I think is, is really dangerous. And as Ruth McGuire mentioned, women were rarely considered in any of the public health messaging around that. And I think that that, um, you know, it's improving, but it still lodges in people's minds. Um, so 30 years on from the discovery of HIV, we know so much more about the virus and we know that people can live with it, but we also know it's a diagnosis that's still rife uh, with, with, with stigma. Um, we're, we're miles away from the era that I described, and everyone has mentioned that today, but the public health measures and messaging around HIV still need to be communicated continuously, loudly and clearly. And I again thank Emma Harper for playing her part in that by allowing us all to, to talk about it in the chamber today, presiding officer. The last of the open debate contributions is from Jamie Green. In the bed was a skeletal young man, wasted away to less than 100 pounds. He told her he wanted to see his mother before he died. So I said, he wants to see his mother. And the nurses laughed. They said, honey, his mother's not coming. He's been here six weeks, nobody's coming. So I phoned his mother and she hung up on me. And I called her back and I said, if you hang up on me again, I will put your son's obituary in your hometown newspaper and I will list his cause of death. And then I had her attention. My son is a sinner, the woman said. This was the words of Ruth Coca Burks, a brave young woman in the mid 1980s in the US who cared for young men dying of what was then known as GRID. Uh, it was a very sad story. She said, I had a little spade and I'd dig the hole and I'd bury them myself. We would have a do it yourself funeral. I couldn't get a priest, I couldn't get a preacher. No one would say anything over the grave 34 years ago. So I think also it's important that we're still having debates like that because I think whilst attitudes have changed, and that is a hugely depressing story, there's also much uh, good that's happened in the last 30 uh, years. And I'd like to use the few minutes I have to talk about some of that good work. Uh, my first, I've got a number of congratulations today. And my first congratulations is to the city of Glasgow because they've signed uh, the Paris Declaration to end new HIV infections by 2030 and do its bit to stop stigma and discrimination. And I say good on Glasgow for doing that. The second, as has been mentioned by others, is the work of a member of the UK Parliament, Mr Lloyd Russell Moyle, and I think his immense bravery in standing up in his national parliament and uh, being open to the world about his HIV status. And I think he did that because, really, he said he wanted to set an example that it's okay to talk about these things in the public domain. But he also said something else, and he wanted to make the point about being undetectable and what that means. And that's my third congratulations, and that's the work that's going on at the moment, today, in Scotland, around U equals U. What it really does is raise awareness that if someone is HIV positive and on the right medication, they are untransmittable, they are un detectable. And that means they cannot pass it on. It's a simple message, but I'm not sure everyone gets it. And the problem is, presiding officers, that 9% of people living with HIV in Scotland do not know. There's still a huge amount of stigma, I think, because of that. People are still afraid to go and get tested. But campaigns like U equals U, I think, says that even if your result is positive, there is treatment out there, you will live a long, healthy and happy life, and you can have sexual partners and relationships like anybody else. I think my next congratulation is around uh, the issue of PrEP, and I'd like to congratulate the Scottish Government. I think uh, the fact that Scotland became the first part of the UK to introduce this treatment is incredible. It's something we should all be extremely proud of, 
Uh, PrEP really has revolutionized uh, the things. It's been a game changer, uh, especially in the LGBT community. Um, for those who aren't aware, uh, perhaps watching this speech, uh, it is a treatment you take before uh, sexual encounters uh, if you're HIV negative, and uh, it reduces your risk. There are estimates that it's up to 99 point something percent. I, I don't have the number to hand. The, the times when it doesn't work is perhaps when people have not been he adhering to the, the regime. But what I would like to point out today, in the short time we have, is that this increased demand on that is putting huge amounts of pressure on services, especially in our cities. My office rang uh, Chalmers in Edinburgh uh, to see how long it would take to get an appointment to register for PrEP, and the answer was at February of next year, so it's three months. Uh, we've called back again this morning in advance of today's bait, and that's come back to January, so it's getting better, but it's clear that the sheer demand for this service is putting a huge strain on those who have to deliver it. So I'd like to congratulate those who are delivering these incredible services across Scotland. Uh, my fifth and final congratulation is to Waverley Care. You'll see I'm wearing the tartan ribbon today. I'd like to thank them for their hospitality at their fundraiser on Saturday night. It was a, a bit of a shindig, as we say, uh, but a huge amount of money was raised. It's, they've been around for 30 years, since the days of Ruth Burks and those horrific stories of how we used to treat people with HIV. And they've done incredible work over those last three decades, and I'd like to congratulate and thank them too. I hope one day uh, we won't have to have debates as somber as the one we have today, because I hope by then we will be uh, just making sure that those who are HIV positive are getting the treatment they need, but we won't be talking about new infections, because there will be new infections. Perhaps a vaccine is just around the corner, who knows? I'm hopeful, but it really does require, and it will need huge amounts of political will. Thank you. And then call him Graham Day uh, to respond to the debate on behalf of the government. Around seven minutes, please, Minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, as others have, uh, I want to thank Emma Harper for bringing this significant matter to the Chamber and indeed all members for their very thoughtful contributions today as we mark the 30th World AIDS Day. This is an important topic and I'm pleased to respond on behalf of the government, standing in for the Minister for Public Health, Joe Fitzpatrick, who was disappointed that he couldn't be here uh, owing to long-standing ministerial business. Presiding Officer, as Mary Fee noted and Patrick Harvey so eloquently re reminded us, the world has come a very long way in relation to HIV and AIDS over the past three decades. Uh, and there's much to be proud of in terms of the progress Scotland has made in this also. Uh, last week, uh, as Emma Harper and Miles Brigg highlighted, we uh, it emerged that we not just met the UN AIDS 90-90-90 target, but we had exceeded it. An estimated 91% of HIV positive people in Scotland know their status, 98% of those are receiving treatment, 97% of those receiving treatment are achieving viral suppression. That's real and significant progress which deserves to be recognised and celebrated. And I want to take a moment to do that before moving on to the work still to come, because the Scottish Government agrees that we cannot and we must not stop now. A key area of progress has been on testing for HIV. It's so important that people who are at risk of HIV get tested and that we remove any barriers to that testing. Uh, I know that in Scotland there are many people across the NHS and the third sector who have worked incredibly hard to find new ways to promote, uh, promote and provide testing and to challenge the misinformation and stigma that can hold people back from coming forward. Another very significant milestone in the effort to tackle HIV in Scotland was met in July of last year when PrEP became available on the NHS. As others have noted, PrEP occupies a very valuable place in our toolkit to prevent new HIV transmissions. We should take pride, as Jamie Green noted, in the fact that Scotland was the first part of the UK to make PrEP available on the NHS to those who need it. And again, I know that A and NH NHS colleagues have worked exceedingly hard to make it available to those who could benefit from taking it. And I note Jamie Green's comments in that regard. Over 1,800 people have started on PrEP in the first year of its availability. That's 1,800 people whose risk of getting HIV is now dramatically lower. I think that's an achievement well worth celebrating. That said, the statistic highlighted by Ruth McGuire that only 10 women have access to drug is a concerning one, and I will ask Mr Fitzpatrick to write to her in response. And I'll also draw to the Minister's attention Patrick Harvey's 
point, uh, his call around the next strategy covering the post-2020 period. Um, whilst we have made this fantastic progress, I agree with Miles Briggs, we cannot risk, uh, rest on our laurels. It's important to recognise there are challenges ahead, challenges to be faced, and it's critical that we work collaboratively in order to keep making progress. Um, I, Emma Harper's references to double globbing still happening and the fact that HIV patients have been placed at the end of dental review lists reminds us of that. With an estimated 9% of people living with HIV unaware of their status, there's also that issue around, uh, or that challenge around um, testing. Working across organisational boundaries will be uh, key here. We need to ensure that third sector organisations are empowered to offer testing and we need to support NHS colleagues across different specialities to be aware of HIV and know when to offer testing to meet Emma Harper's challenge, find, reach, treat. The Scottish Government is providing over £2 million to organisations dealing with sexual health and bloodborne viruses between 2018 and 2021. The organisations funded include Waverley Care, HIV Scotland and the Scottish Drugs Forum, all of which have a role to play in promoting testing to different communities in Scotland who are most at risk. The outbreak of HIV amongst people who inject drugs in Glasgow serves as an important reminder that we cannot afford to be complacent. Last week, my colleague Joe Fitzpatrick paid a visit to the staff in NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde who have been involved in tackling the outbreak there. He was impressed by their dedication and by the collaborations they've established in order to tackle the outbreak. But we want to do more. As we stated in the alcohol and drug strategy, which was published last week, the Scottish Government will support measures which may initially seem controversial or unpopular. This includes the introduction of supervised drug consumption facilities, which are driven by a clear evidence base. Uh, Mr Fitzpatrick met with the UK Government a few weeks ago. Regrettably, their stance continues to be that they will not allow such an initiative uh, to proceed, uh, but we will continue to press uh, for a change in the law or for the devolution of the necessary powers. As many colleagues have rightly raised in their contributions to this debate, HIV stigma has no place in Scotland today. We must all commit to seeing the individual person and never reduce or define someone by their HIV status. We must continue to challenge misinformation and to spread the word that a person diagnosed with HIV in Scotland today can expect to live a full life with near normal life expectancy. And we must share the message that an individual with a sustained, undetectable level of HIV viral load in their blood is unable to transfer HIV to their sexual partners. As colleagues have made clear time and time again in this debate, undetectable equals untransmittable. Uh, Presiding officer, I'll finish where I started by again thanking Emma Harper and everyone who's contributed to this debate. Presiding officer. That concludes the debate and this meeting is suspended until half past two.